Hey everybody, and welcome to episode 36 of the iFreak Show. This week on our panel, we have James Zuber. Hello from Minneapolis. Pete Hodgson. Hello from San Francisco. Ben Sherman's going to be joining us in a few. This is kind of a weird Christmas episode that we're recording a little bit early. I'm Charles Maxwood from DevChat.tv. And I just want to announce really quickly that if you go to RailsRampUp.com and you sign up before the end of the year, the 31st, basically, actually, I'm going to give you a few extra days. If you sign up by the 4th, then you can get 30% off if you want to learn Ruby on Rails, which is kind of a handy thing for back-end stuff. Anyway, this week we're going to talk about some of the differences between some of our uh, language backgrounds that we have. Um, some of us come from uh, more enterprise languages like .NET or Java, and some of us come from uh, the hippie languages like Ruby. So uh, it should be an interesting <laughs> discussion. I think so. So uh, real quickly, besides Objective-C, what, what are kind of your uh, languages that come out of your tool bag when you need to do something different? Well, for a long time, I did like C Sharp and .NET, like even before that. It was kind of C and C++ embedded stuff, kind of thick client stuff. So I can write C in any language, pretty much. <laughs> but uh, things that I kind of like with Objective-C is I'm getting more familiar with kind of the how a dynamic language really helps us out, especially with like testing and being able to be more fluid with our, our development. So I like that, but definitely more, I definitely do a, come from a static language background. I don't know, what about you guys? So I guess I've been kind of all over the place. I started off my career in C++. So when I first kind of started doing iOS development, that actually felt quite familiar in some ways, doing manual man memory management and all that fun stuff. And then I bounced around a bunch. I did some C Sharp. I did uh, a fair amount of Ruby. I still do quite a lot of Ruby. I do a lot of JavaScript. I do my current project. I'm writing Scala. I'm doing embedded C++ development in my spare time at the moment with Arduinos. So I guess I've been kind of all over the place, but my main, my language I reach for most is probably, is probably Ruby still, I'd say. And I, yeah, I've, it's, it's interesting. I guess I've come to my journey into Objective-C is the opposite where I'm coming more from a dynamic place and seeing how it's actually quite nice to have a type system sometimes or have a, a static type system sometimes and annoying as well. Very nice. There's a good fight we can have right now. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I've, if, it, uh, if you ever want to play with a, a, a strong type system, do some Scala development, and you'll either fall in love with type safety or you'll absolutely hate it. It's, it's been driving me a little bit crazy, but it's, it's also pretty cool. But anyway, that's, a, I guess, a different podcast. Yeah. I, my, my background, I mean, I did uh, Java and C++ in college but didn't really take it seriously. I was a systems administrator for a long time and actually wrote a pretty extensive uh, backup, or not backup, system update management system cobbled together mostly with Bash. And so I've done a fair bit of Bash programming. And then I, I moved into uh, tech support, and I ran a tech support stuff, so I was programming management. And then um, I realized that I liked programming more than I liked management, so I... By then, I had picked up Ruby, and uh, that's kind of been my mainstay for the last six or seven years. And then I've been learning Objective-C, and, you know, obviously I do a bunch of stuff with JavaScript. And then I'm looking into a few other languages. I'm I'm kind of starting to uh, get interested in things like Erlang or Elixir, but I haven't really played with them enough to speak intelligently about how they work. So, but My commiserations for your Bash programming. Yeah. <laughs> That's not something I would ever want to do. It's 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 definitely an interesting approach, and I think of it as a high level language. But the problem is, is that uh, most high level languages tend to uh, name things and set things up so that you can actually look at them and guess at what they do. And Bash really isn't that way. You you have to understand what the commands are and how to determine what all of it is. And I spend a lot of time on Google, you know. Yeah. If this directory exists, you know, and then it's if minus D, you know, directory name or something. And yeah, anyway, and the syntax is a little bit funny too. And so it really gets interesting pretty fast, but it's all, the other thing that's interesting about it is that it's mostly procedural stuff that you're doing. So you, you're really not approaching things from ob objective or object oriented or really a functional uh, way of doing things. You can write functions, but they're really not treated as first class citizens. You you know, you're either calling them or you're not, and that's about it. You must have some pretty awesome post build scripts. I'd like to see them. <laughs> post build scripts for what? For iOS or whatever you're doing. 
Uh, not not really. I, okay. I don't do much bash programming these days. Though I have gotten into Chef, which is managed mostly, again, in Ruby. But, yeah, you do get some arcane bash stuff going on in there, too, just depending on what you got to get done. Right on. So I'm interested to hear what you guys miss from those other languages when you're in Objective-C. So, like, Chuck, what do you miss from Ruby when you're doing iOS development? So the strong typing type systems, um, you know, where everything returns a specific kind of value and things like that, I, I miss a lot of the flexibility you get out of Ruby. In Ruby, you don't have to go and uh, declare your methods in your header files. You don't have to go and do a lot of this other boilerplate stuff. I mean, you can just kind of, oh, I want that, and then you just make it happen. And I understand why it's that way with Objective-C being an extension of C. I guess I should have mentioned I was a computer engineering major in college, so I also wrote a fair bit of C. And uh, to be honest, Java was okay, C++ was painful, and I loved writing in C, which is weird for most people, but, <laughs> you know, assembly was fun to write and hell to debug, but yeah. So I understand why it's there, but at the same time, you know, I just, I kind of miss being able to just on the fly go new method, you know, or new object and, and, and not have to think about, okay, did I go and declare this all the right way somewhere else so that something else knows that this is part of the interface that I'm implementing. Does that but make sense? It, I mean, it does make sense, but I guess that the argument that static typing fans would make, maybe, is that you get a lot of... The flip side of that is you, is you get the kind of the benefits of knowing what the types that uh, your method takes and your method returns are. So you can, A, I guess you don't need to write so many tests, maybe, because you don't, the, the compiler is checking more stuff for you. I don't know, have you noticed that, that you find less runtime errors in your code and more compile errors in your code? Because I've definitely, that's something I really like about um, a, a more static typing system like, like Objective-C, is that you get, you can just kind of hit build and see what breaks. Like if you want to rename something, you can just rename it, hit build, and the compiler or the static analyzer can do a lot of the work that otherwise you'd have to do with tests in, in a language like Ruby or JavaScript. Yeah, I was going to point out that for the most part, I just write tests around things. So if I'm expecting something to be a certain type, I'll just write a test on it. That being said, yeah, I have to do that manually. The, the benefits that you're talking about, though, with uh, the static typing, I tend to see a little bit more as a benefit of having a compiled language. And so your compiler, when it does the static analysis and does the, you know, compiles it, you know, when it compiles it, it basically has to pass a syntax check and it has to pass a certain level of sanity checks. And so since those are all built into the process of building, um, you get the benefit because it, you know, it has to do all of that up front. And so you get that check just like you get the check when you write the test in Ruby. Um, the difference is, is that uh, a lot of those tests are just built in because the compiler does that job for you. And so I don't know if it's static, statically typed languages as much as it is just that you have that step where you get a major sanity check right up front because it won't build if it's not right. Yeah, you get all the uninteresting stuff thrown in for free. You know, if the app yeah. actually works or not, that's not tested, but you get some, a lot of stuff thrown in for free, but it's not really the, the critical stuff. Yeah, but at the same time, I mean, that's really the stuff that you don't want to think about. And so to that end, I mean, it's really nice, you know. Is this giving me back what I expect? Well, it has to, because if it's not, then I'm going to get an error when I try and compile it or build it. You know, if is it behaving in a specific way? Yeah, some of that you get out of the compiler and some of that you don't. So, you know, it's it's that trade-off. It's but but at the same time, I mean so so it is a nice thing to have. It's just I'm not completely sold that static typing is is why that works out so nicely. Well, I think I mean the two kind of go hand in hand like you need static typing for the compiler to do its thing uh, and because you have the compiler doing that thing it, that's the point which this, the type system the types get checked right essentially the type checking either gets done at compile time or at runtime I don't know if there's any languages really that do that much runtime type checking I, I guess I think we're, we're in agreement just I'm looking at it in terms of the type checker and you're looking at it in terms of the compilation but I think they're kind of they're both pretty much the same thing yeah, they're, they're both part of the same process. So, you know, it, ju it just comes down to what you value. And 
I know a lot of people who, you know, they, they take a look at a language like Ruby or JavaScript or Python or some of these other languages where, you know, you really don't enforce type very often. And uh, it kind of freaks them out. And it does I'm, take a while to get used to that. Yeah, I can I can definitely understand where you get used to being able to just count on something, you know, having a specific set of behaviors. In other words, being a specific type. It, it definitely makes sense. Are there any languages that are not statically typed that are compiled? Yeah, I'm I'm kind of like wondering what you would how well I guess so go is kind of like that. It is it has like inferred types I guess where you don't um give something a type, you just kind of uh it has a bunch of methods that it implements and when you define a method, you say and this is me like not having actually done that much go development, so um if you actually know what you're talking about, please forgive me. But with, with Go, you kind of say what interfaces your method's going to take. Uh, let's say your method's going to take a, a user and uh, a user object and a, a bank account object. You define like two kind of protocols that uh, implement those two interfaces, if you will. And then when you're actually implementing those classes, you don't have to say, oh, I implement the user protocol or I implement the, the account protocol. The um, Go, like when it compiles, actually just looks at your class and says, okay, you implement these four methods, so therefore implicitly you Im- implement that interface so so you can plug in here. So it's still done statically at compile time, but you don't have to do as much explicit kind of type declaration stuff where you say, I am implementing the user protocol or whatever. <clears throat> that's, the, that's the only one I can think of that's more dynamic in that regard. So I, well, one question about that, and you may not, you might know. So what if you kind of partially implement one of the one of the classes or interfaces and try and use it. Do you get a compile error? Yep. Okay. Yeah, it just says, you know, you can't use the, you, this object that you're trying to pass in doesn't implement this uh, protocol or the equivalent words in Go in Go kind of parlance. This thing doesn't implement this protocol, so you can't pass it in here. So you still have that static analysis where it will say it can check the types at compile time and say this thing does implement it or it doesn't. So everything does have a static type, but you don't have to do as much explicit work. It's a bit like how in like C sharp now there's kind of type inference where you don't have to say, you know, uh, foo foo equals new foo. You just say var foo equals new foo and, and it knows what type the thing is. It's kind of the same thing, but with what, what protocol do you implement? Okay. Syntactic sugar a little bit. Yeah. And it's nice because it gives you, it gives a little bit of that flavor of Ruby where you don't have to think about, like Chuck said, but you don't have to think about what interfaces you're implementing. You just kind of, you just kind of, if you, if you, if it quacks like a duck, it, it, uh, it's a duck kind of thing. But actually, yeah, statically, statically checked rather than you having to write a test that says, does it quack like a duck? Yeah, exactly. So in Ruby, you do have modules which you can think of sort of like protocols, except that there's no checking to make sure that it implements the protocol. And so you can actually go in and manually implement every method that you need to have that protocol, and it still counts. And in Objective-C and some of these other languages, um, you know, if you if you bring in a protocol, you know, you, you implement some interface, some common interface between different types of objects, then it will actually check and say, did you explicitly include this protocol into your class? And if you didn't, then it does not implement that protocol, even if it does behave like that protocol. And it, it makes sense. I, I, I like, I do like that approach where it does kind of have that built-in check. But sometimes it's nice to have the flexibility to be able to just work around it or partially implement it. What about you, Jane? What's your take coming from the other side? Like, what do you miss from from uh, from C sharp or from other static languages? Right. So initially, I, I missed you know properties and things like that, which Objective C has caught up you know, in the, in the past few years or so. So it's gotten a little, a lot more familiar for people, you know, coming from an OHO background, dealing with like properties and things like that. I think one of the things I miss is some of the language support. Like I did a lot of C sharp and C sharp has things like link, which is like language integrated query where you can do more of a functional style of programming. So I, that's one thing I, I really kind of missed. And I realized there's some, some objective C libraries that kind of do certain things and, and that's available in Ruby, that type of thing being able to query over a set of objects. So I missed a little bit of the kind of the, the language features that I, I got in like C sharp. But other than that, you know, I kind of, I liked uh, kind of the features that I got from being able to test a dynamic language. I think if you trying to write tests for C sharp or Java and you want to test something in the framework and make sure that's interacting correctly, 
you end up having to do all these just really convoluted injection things where you wrap every framework element in some kind of class just so you can test it and you inject the framework element like a date. So I really enjoyed being able to just stub out things like a date, like date now or something, you know, notification. So that's something that I've really enjoyed learning kind of coming into Objective C is just being able to test code without doing all these convoluted tricks to get kind of decent test coverage if I'm using framework elements. That's kind of what I I learned. I guess you get some of the some of the link type stuff now with or you can fake out some of the niceties of, of things like link with with blocks, but I think you end up I don't know, it doesn't feel as as easy to to do. Uh yeah. it doesn't seem as as fluid as using lambdas in in link or in in a functional language or in JavaScript, for example. Yeah, blocks are definitely more bulky than kind of the C-sharp version, yeah. the anonymous functions. But they kind of feel forward. like a bit of a leaky abstraction to me. Like you, you, you have to know under the covers it's like passing around references to things and you have to remember, oh, is this supposed to be strong, a strong reference or a weak reference? And yep. Do I need to put under under the block there or not? Do I have to nil this out if I'm done with it? Do I know this is yeah. being hit? It's... Yeah, you get into some weird edge cases on iOS that you don't have to deal with as much kind of in .NET. Yeah. But overall, I'm glad they're there. What about, Chuck, from your... Do you say stuff from JavaScript that you miss, or is it more of the same? Is it the same kind of stuff as, as, as Ruby? So it's kind of interesting. Between Ruby and JavaScript, I think the thing that throws me off the most often is uh, semicolons. <laughs> and uh, the nice thing is that... Uh, Hang on a second. You don't use semicolons in JavaScript, Chuck? Oh, I don't use Uh-oh. semicolons in Ruby. Uh, okay. But you can. You can write all your Ruby on one line. That's mm-hmm. right. If you if you use a semicolon in Ruby and you don't put another command after it, it complains at you. And so in JavaScript, it does do the semicolon insertion, but it seems like I always I always find the cases where it screws it up. So um, I've gotten better about putting it in. I just kind of switch my brain into JavaScript mode. But yeah, so JavaScript to Objective C, I don't know. I mean, they're, they're so different. JavaScript's a prototypal based languages and, you know, Objective C is mostly, uh, object oriented. Um, it does have some functional aspects to it and so does JavaScript, but I don't know. It, it doesn't really, I don't know. The, the, the two of them comparing them, it just doesn't make it a ton of sense to me because they're, they're so different in the way that they approach so many things where, uh, the way that I approach things in Objective C, I, approach the same way in Ruby in a lot of cases. I think for me, the the main thing that, I mean, I guess I'm just restating it's unsurprisingly I'm restating what I just said because that's what made me think of it. The, the first class functions, like the fact that with JavaScript it's really ridiculously easy to just new, or new not new up, to create an anonymous function and pass it around and if you compare that to like blocks in Objective-C then it's really uh, it's a, it's like night and day. And and I, I guess that part of that is because you get the You've got a garbage collected language in in JavaScript or something like that, whereas in Objective C, although it feels a lot of the time like you're not doing memory management, you still have to be aware of the aware of the memory management. Yeah, that's definitely one thing I had to get used to when I first started playing with Objective C. It yeah. was when Arc was real new and people didn't trust it, and so yeah, you know, retain and release and all that fun stuff. So one of the things that I really like about Objective C coming from the uh, dynamic world of, of Ruby and JavaScript is having an IDE that actually knows what's happening and being able to command click on things and actually go to the definition of the methods and things like that. I get incredibly frustrated at how poor Xcode is at doing things like refactoring, given that it does know so much about the types and what things are involved. But that ability to command click on things and and go to the declaration or find usages and, and things like that, I think is is so is really really nice and I, that's the that's the thing I miss a lot when I go from Objective C to to doing Ruby development or JavaScript development. Yeah, you know what I find interesting is uh, doing Ruby motion is you know you're running through UI Kit but with a different flavor, right? And so it seems like it would be a lot less code. It turns out it's not. It's not a, a lot less code. It's it's you know slightly different syntax and sometimes more favorable syntax, but when you're dealing with asynchronous code, you have the same problem with like lots of callbacks and and things like that. I feel like that's some of the beauty gets 
sort of lost. Like when you're doing a Rails apps, a lot of times you're just in you're in a web request and you're going to go get some data from a database. You're going to format it this way and render a template, and that's all just you know line line line. It's all procedural. Uh, there's no like async uh, code that you really have to worry about there, which I find to be liberating. It's it's kind of nice uh, to write code like that. And then you go to a you know, sort of a smart device uh, that has a main thread that's painting the UI for you. You can't interrupt that. Uh, so pretty much everything you do has to be on a background thread. So you end up doing a lot of the block, you know, callbacks or the delegate uh, methods. That sounds like JavaScript development, actually. It does, yeah. yeah. So I wonder if part of that is because um, people haven't quite wrapped up the APIs nicely yet. I, I don't know. I have mixed feelings of that. You know, like on on one hand, you have things like bubble wrap, and they're pretty well designed, and they handy for a lot of applications, but it ends up looking like a different thing. You know, like it might feel more like Ruby, but it feels less like UI kit. And so that that yeah, is sort of a, you know, there's a, a, a spectrum, right? And on the left side, you're just dealing with UI kit and all the UI kit classes, but in Ruby. And on the right hand side, you've abstracted everything. So it doesn't even look like UI kit anymore. And uh, I think there are drawbacks to, to making everything, abstracting away UI kit, because there's a whole lot of power there, and you know, if you if you just create wrappers for everything to make it easier, I don't know, you could lose out on some of the powerful stuff underneath. Yeah, one of the things though that I really like about some of the wrappers that you get around some of the libraries out there is that if you're just working the eighty to ninety percent case, it works great, and then you don't even have to think about a lot of that other stuff. And then when you have to drop into, okay, well, you know, I'm kind of in that ten to twenty percent of stuff that really doesn't fit this uh, the assumptions that this library is making, then you can drop down into, you know, UI kit or something else. And That's as long as take advantage uh, of it. As long as the, the the abstraction you're using or the higher level thing you're using hasn't kind of welded the, the hood shut so that you can't kind of get under there when you need to, you know? I, I guess that's true. But I, I think that's that's more a property of, of what library you're using or what abstraction you're using rather than like a fundamental problem. Like I've used some high level languages or high level frameworks that let you get down into the guts when you need to. Um, I actually, I think objective or the, the, you know, the UI kit frameworks do a pretty good job of that. But, uh, like for, for core animation, for example, but I've also used some, some systems where you get that 80% done and then you, and then, you know, you, you're like, okay, now all I need to do is this one last little piece. And, uh, and you kind of slam into this glass ceiling where you can't, um, you can't do that last piece without rewriting the, you know, the, the 80% that seems so easy to do using the abstraction. That's like the primrose path of perdition of all the cross platform frameworks. First 78%, it's, it's easy. <laughs> <laughs> and the last 30%, 20%, very hard. Say yep. that five times fast. The primrose Ooh. path of perdition. I'm surprised I got it out there. That was pretty good. Thank you, Drake. You know, I was uh, I was going through a bunch of old videos that I have on my Mac, and I came across an old uh, presentation I gave to. We had we used to have this uh, Houston Geek Dinner, and we uh, head to a good pizza place and have some beer and just talk shop. And uh, that was around the time when I got into iOS development. This was probably 2009. Yeah, this is 2009. So it was Xcode three, and I was watching myself type. And Xcode 3 was way more responsive than Xcode 4 was. I was running on an old 13-inch MacBook Pro, not a powerful device at all. And uh, just watching myself type, it just seemed like it made me nostalgic for Xcode 3. Even though Xcode 4 brings a lot of cool stuff, it has certainly gone a little bit clunky and sort of soft around the middle as it gets gains in features. Have you guys noticed that, or is it just sort of like the boiled frog phenomenon? I think it's both. I think it is. I think that's, I, so I... I've noticed the same thing with my, geez, what type of iPhone is this? Why don't they put the number of the iPhone? I can't remember which <laughs> iPhone. The non-tall iPhone. I have the most. The, iPhone the, 4S? Uh, yeah, probably one of those guys. And on iOS 7, it is noticeably a little bit laggy. And I, and I, I think that's just because, you know, they're expecting, uh, they're kind of designing for, they're, you know, uh, taking Moore's Law Leveraging Moore's law and assuming that most people are going to be on newer hardware fairly soon, so let's write the software assuming there's newer hardware. Yeah, even iOS six. I had an iPhone four for a long time. And iOS six was still a little bit laggy. I didn't upgrade to iOS seven. I kind of waited till the five S came out and jumped on that. But that's definitely how it goes. 
I remember the yes. uh, doing iOS development for. It must have been when did the iPad first come out? Was that iOS four? Uh, I think so. I know that around, it's, it's stuck on iOS five now. The iPad it was around that the time. original iPad, iPad. iPad came out and it, they created a new version just for that. It was three point two. Three point two. That's right. So. I remember doing that development in, in that era and we had to test it against like an original iPhone or like an iPhone 2 or something. And that thing just chugged. Like it was like horrible to use. Horrible, horrible to use. Just, just with the latest, you know, with iPhone, iOS 3.2 and the oldest hardware that it would run on, it was just not an enjoyable experience to, to use that device. So back to other languages. Have you guys built any apps using languages other than? Objective C. I know that Ben. It sounds like you've done some stuff with Ruby Motion. I have a license for Ruby Motion, but I haven't actually done anything with it yet. Uh, yeah, my my license was just more for me to play around with, just to see if it's something I should investigate further. I mean, I've I've probably mentioned this on the show before that I I, I have a background in .NET and and I like Ruby. And so when I came to Objective C, I was fully planning on just ditching the language for like uh, Monotouch. Uh, and if Ruby Motion had been out at the time, I would have probably heavily considered that because I didn't like the language at first. And over time, you know, call it Stockholm Syndrome or call it just my own maturity. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, eventually, I just started to like Objective C, and it's it's wordy, but that wordy can that being wordy can pay off in very readable method names, very descriptive, like almost documentation like method names. Uh, so, you know, I just decided I don't need to ditch Objective-C. I, I kind of like it. And I also like the sort of being on the blessed path has its benefits. I do have to say that was one other thing that coming from a language like Ruby or some of the other languages that I work in. Yeah, just the way that you define method names and you like you uh, intersperse the arguments with them and all that. It just yeah. that totally threw me for a loop. It was like, That's, it totally threw stuff? me and I really, I really disliked that. Yeah, I, I didn't like it for a long time, and then after a while it was like, you know, if I write these names right, they really do tell me exactly what I'm doing here. Yeah. yeah it almost it's, reads like a That's like a classic thing. So it's... That was absolutely the thing that I really disliked, and I, I, I vividly remember on that first iOS project that I was on, like, whining to people about how silly this, this feature was, and now I really miss it in every other language I use. I really wish other languages. I, I kind of all, almost wish all languages had that that thing because it it really annoys me otherwise because you get. So what I do, what I like doing a lot in uh, in Objective C and in other languages is that is that Objective C thing of like saying, log in with username blah and password blah because it like reads more like a sentence, right? But if you do that with Ruby or JavaScript or Scala or whatever, what you end up saying is like log in with username and then you put the username in. And then when you add a second parameter, you're like, oh, now I have to say log in. And then half my methods say log in with username or something like that. And then my other methods say, you know, log in using whatever else. But you can't, if there's more than one parameter, you can't have that nice with blah, with blah, and blah using yada, yada. You can in Ruby Does that make any sense? Ruby you, not has really. same parameters. Oh, it does, right. Yeah, yeah. Is that the yeah, same? It, can you still, it looks can you have that very style? similar to, it, it looks very similar to how it, they do it today with just option hashes at the end, but yeah, uh, it's not the I like the I like the notion that they can have defaults, and yeah. and <laughs> it's a little bit. I guess I haven't really seen it in practice, but I, from my understanding, is it's easier to read and understand what parameters should be passed rather than just taking a, a hash. Yep, and they're I, named. I, the order I don't believe is significant. So if you're passing them in as named parameters, you can put them in whatever order you need to. So. You can have login with username or login with username and password, and you can set defaults for the and password, or you can just leave it off and handle when it's nil, and all of that stuff, you know, plays nicely. Maybe it's because I did a lot of C++ back in the day, but I really fear defaults in parameters. <laughs> <laughs> I just remember getting myself into so many problems as the code base aged a little bit. Yeah, you got to <laughs> be careful with them, that's for sure. So Ben, you haven't done any any. Uh, you said you played around with Ruby Motion. Have you played around with Xamarin? You know, like the Monotouch stuff at all. Yes. So I was. Uh, if I don't say my, so myself, I was pretty badass 
.NET developer. <laughs> <laughs> you did say so yourself. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. I was, I was actually okay. I knew C Sharp pretty well. I will just say that. And then, you know, fast forward three, three and a half years, almost four years now that I haven't been doing .NET. And I don't know, maybe six months ago, I, I tried to um, just fire up the Xamarin. They came out with their own Xamarin Studio, so you don't have to use Mono Develop anymore. And it, it looks really nice. So I was, I thought I'd give it another go. And it turns out I really suck at .NET now. <laughs> I just, it, it, it was kind of funny, like the, the characters were not flowing from my fingertips the way I sort of expected them to. So that muscle is certainly atrophied. <laughs> so, uh, and one of those problems was, I, and similar to what I mentioned a minute ago, the difference between web programming and async sort of smart device programming. The, the async stuff in .NET was not necessarily familiar to me because it's not what I did on a day-to-day basis. Uh, I did a little bit of it. Uh, and on top of that, with .NET 4, I think there's like the await keyword uh, and the async, async keyword that lets you write code in sort of like a more procedural style. However, it's, it's more like futures. All that stuff is new to me because I left .NET before that happened. So turns out, yes, I did try to do it, and I'm kind of terrible at it now. Hmm. See, that all that stuff is the stuff that I... Um makes me really interested in in Xamarin as a as a platform is that it seems quite those features the the await and generators and all that stuff and then the um first class well not really first class functions but making it really easy to make lambdas and, and callbacks and stuff like that make feels like it would be it would lend itself quite nicely to to objective c development well not objective c development iOS development I guess. Yeah that was one of the things I really liked because I think I cut my teeth on iOS development with monotouch you know, a few years ago when it was still mono touch. But yeah, just being able to fire off an anonymous function when blocks were still pretty new and having properties when Objective C didn't really support them. But that was pretty, that was one of the benefits I, I found from it. But I think Objective C is caught up in a lot of ways with properties and autosynthesis as far as being, letting you be productive and creating objects and improving your code that way. I do think that they've addressed some of the, the kind of the things that made it really easy to make fun of Objective C, like, the new object literal, or not really that new anymore, but the object literal, so I don't have to say NS array array with objects and all that craft. Um, I think that's really, that's, yeah, those are, those it's, are it's less, it's less easy to make fun of Objective C now. I think really the only thing left is the, is the ridiculous method names, but I think we actually all have said that we quite like that. So it, I mean, I like it, but it's kind of impossible to do without code completion, right? Yeah. And I, I really like Vim for Ruby. But that's because I've sort of committed what I know, what I need to know from Ruby and Rails to memory, and I, I know how to look up the rest. Uh, so mm-hmm. I appreciate the sort of fast typing and, you know, quick in and out I can use with Vim, but I, ca- I just can't do it with Objective C. I've tried. <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah. So Chuck, you asked if we've done development with other languages. I've got an outlier in that I've done a small amount of iOS development with JavaScript using this kind of kind of cross-platform play- framework called Calatrava. I think I talked about it a, a quite a while ago on the show. But that lets you do the business logic in, well, you know, the app logic in JavaScript, but you can do the actual UI coding in Objective-C. So you don't have that glass ceiling thing of, like, you get the 80% done and then you then you can't do the rest. So that's, that's an interesting one, but that's a little bit of an exotic example. Yeah, I, I have to say I did a little bit with Accelerator Titanium. Yeah. And it was, <laughs> it, it it was kind of, I don't know. And this was a while ago. I know that they've added a bunch of polish to it. I don't want to to bag oh, on them at all. But oh it, no, 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 no! Bag all you want. It's yeah. Quiet. I think <laughs> I, between me, you, and Ben, I think we're going to be bag. But but the issue that I had was that it felt like it felt like all the pieces were kind of cobbled together. Like there wasn't a cohesive way to just build stuff. I've talked to a few people. I think that story's gotten better. I, I know that there are some limitations in the way that they're, they approach it because most of your stuff just runs in a web view and you don't get all of the native stuff and they kind of go for the lowest common denominator between the different platforms that they support. But So my understanding is that it, it doesn't necessarily run in a web view. So if you use like the ti.iphone.navigation bar or whatever it's called, that it is actually going to render a real iOS navigation bar. But that's not going to be cross-platform, clearly, because it's got iOS in the namespace. 
So there are things like that that will run natively. So you can really like native table view based applications in it, but the the code is still interpreted through a web view. Yeah. And that's a web yeah. view embedded in your app that doesn't benefit from the Nitro JavaScript engine that's available in mobile Safari. So that's that's one issue that your code is never going to be as fast as to raw Objective-C code. Uh, and in many that's cases, definitely... that might not matter, right? That's but, true, yeah. but also, uh, I think that's actually only half true now. So, yes, it's going to be JavaScript, not um, Objective-C. So that's, you know, compiled versus interpreted. But I think JavaScript without the, Core Without now... Nitro? No, without I think Nitro, JavaScript I think Core it's... now has Nitro. That's Because it used to be that you had to use a web view and you didn't get the what's called the code rewriting, but I think okay. I feel yeah, like so JavaScript this, when I used does this, that. This was in UI web views, which I still think doesn't yeah. use Nitro, but I'm not sure about JavaScript Core, which is probably I how, think, yeah. where their architecture is heading. Uh, it makes yeah. sense to have the rather than have like an invisible web view that you use just for like data in and out. But yeah, I mean, I I had similar problems. Like I I looked for guidance on how to build a real application, and I got a really I got a bunch of really horrible like Hello World type. <laughs> um, examples, and they didn't teach me, they didn't follow conventions that Apple had, certainly. I mean, maybe I shouldn't expect them to, because it's cross-platform, but it just didn't seem to have a, a real direction at all. Uh, so I thought it would be nice to, sort of, breath of fresh air to be able to use CoffeeScript, and, and uh, there's a, a TI gem that has some stuff that you can basically run your build and rake, and there's some testing support built in. I thought that stuff would be really, really cool, but turns out it's it wasn't that easy to get going, and I had serious questions about how to sort of how the architecture of a large app would be. So um, I don't know. In the end, this was just a one-day hackathon that we did internally, uh, just to sort of spread our wings, so to speak, and understand what's out there. And I came away with a very sour taste in my mouth about titanium. Yeah, I do want to point out. So we're we're talking about. Basically, it allows you to write your iPhone apps. It also does uh, Android and I believe uh, BlackBerry. You you write them in JavaScript, and so that's that's kind of the appeal if you're already doing JavaScript for other things. And, and phone, I think that you can is, uh, is also JavaScript, incidentally. The phone gap's different because that's not got that native aspect. It's just yes. wrapping web views in in enough of a native shell so that you can access the hardware and you can access the platform. Which is good if you want to. I don't know. I've I've had I've heard of some folks at Fortworks who who like um, PhoneGap for like rapid prototyping. So, kind of building a, a version, not even a version one point of an app, but version zero point one of an app or something, and throwing it together quickly with HTML and JavaScript, and then kind of putting it out there and seeing how people use it, and and then kind of iterating from that, and they end up just re, you know throw, it's a throwaway prototype basically. You build something quick and put it out there and see whether people like it or not, and then if you want to double down on it, then kind of actually build it for real using, you know, some other technology. Yeah, I can see the value there where you would, you know, basically use it to quickly prototype something out, kind of get a proof of concept. It's a proof of concept you can run on your phone, which is also very nice. Yeah. So. And it's also, I mean, for people who are, you know, uh, there's a lot more competent, uh, well, maybe I'll caveat that statement. There's a lot more HTML and JavaScript devs than there are objective c devs so for people who want to get into the iphone or ipad world it's kind of like a a lower barrier to entry maybe and you can kind of get your feet wet and and then once you feel a bit more comfortable with the the mechanisms of building a mobile app versus a web app then you can maybe start getting serious about it and and learn use some square braces (laughs) (laughs) i I don't know i'd I'd like to push back a little bit on that Uh, i think that's it's a it's a good sales pitch to say, oh, we already know HTML, we already know JavaScript, except you don't know this HTML and JavaScript, right? Like this is not creating web pages for it. And a, a really sort of distilled example of this is like you should never use a click event. Uh, and you're like, wait a minute, that's how I will wire up in JavaScript a click for a button to do something. Yeah. And what what you may not realize if you're not uh, in this world is you know, you put your finger down on the on the screen and a web view has to say, wait, 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 is this a touch or is this a scroll? Is he trying to click it or is he going to move his finger? And so there's a 30 millisecond delay before it will actually deliver a click event. And this is why, like, the majority of just general web page style apps just don't feel right. There are ways around this, right? You can use mouse down events or whatever. There may be some more uh, 
newer this sort of concepts. The touchdown. Okay, so there are newer concepts, but this is my point: is that like it's not web development, you know? So just because we uh, have that skill set doesn't mean we're going to hit the ground running. I think it's going to be the opposite. I think it's going to be familiar language and structure, all new style of programming, and perhaps. Okay, APIs. so you, you, so your your take is it's kind of like a false friend because it feels it feels like yep. you've got the tools, but actually, if you use them, you'll end up doing the wrong thing. Yep. It's kind of the hidden costs you worry about that don't seem obvious up front. Yeah, and you look at these like case studies where somebody has done just like these amazing jobs at creating a, a really awesome HTML5 app, and those people are freaking experts, like complete top of their field. You know what I mean? Like the uh, what the specific examples I'm, I'm thinking of is is the uh, you know Facebook rewrote their app to be more native because uh, because it was slow, right? And the uh, the Sencha Touch guys said, well, no, it doesn't have to be slow. We'll create our own version of Facebook, and we'll make it really fast. I mean, and those people are seriously experts in this technology. So just your, you know, average, like, web developer isn't going to necessarily have the skills to understand the problems and have viable workarounds in HTML and JavaScript. Like, infinitely scrollable lists, for instance. Like, you have an image tag uh, on a table view row where, like, you know, what's essentially a div, right? And you scroll it up, and eventually that image tag needs to release that image. But if it's still part of the DOM, then it's going to continue to uh, retain memory for that referenced image. So literally, you have to know when to, like, clear out the image source attribute so that it can release that image. And if you start rewriting the DOM, then your scroll position changes. And there's just lots of, like, edge cases. I, I think, you know, this is a choice, and people can make this choice, and I'm sure you can make great apps with it. I feel like you need to like master that set of constraints and understand all the workarounds. And I think that that is an equal amount of effort than just learning the native way. That's my position. And yes, I mean, I, I, I totally agree that, that getting that last bit of polish to make it make a, a web app look anything close to native is really, really hard, like way more work than just learning Objective-C. <laughs> I guess my, my take is that for someone that wants to just build like a to-do list, they might get intimidated trying to figure out all of the stuff of how to build a mobile app and a new language and new technologies and new IDEs and all the rest of it at the same time. So maybe they can start off with building, learning one half, learning the, the mobile, uh, what makes a mobile app useful, the kind of the UX side of things using familiar technologies. And then once they've learned that stuff, then they can do the other half rather than having to learn it all at once. But I, I mean, I, I definitely, I very much agree with your point that you're not gonna, they, these, none of these technologies are some silver bullet where you can suddenly, you know, keep using all of your familiar tools and, and knock out a, um, a, a Facebook equivalent, uh, just, you know, without having to fundamentally learn lots of stuff. That's honestly one thing I think is so funny about people who go to Ruby Motion is that, I mean, yeah, you get some of the niceties that you get from Ruby from the language, you know, if you're more familiar with that than some of the quirks of Objective-C. Of course, you could see that the other way, you know. Those people like the quirks of Ruby. Either way, the thing is, is that you still have to understand all of the APIs because it statically compiles against those other libraries, and so you still have to make those calls against those same functions in order to make your app work. And so, yeah, you get a native app, but the shortcuts are all language shortcuts. They're not library shortcuts. And so you still have to familiarize yourself with all of the APIs that are available to build an app. And there's no shortcut for that. Yeah, and, and learning an API that was built for it, the idioms of another language is really, is, is quite hard, right? Like, it's quite jarring to try and follow Objective-C, idiomatic Objective-C APIs in another language like Ruby because it's just fundamentally expect, you know, the patterns are different, the way that you name things is different. There's all these tiny little differences that make you feel like you're kind of a stranger in a strange land. Yep. All right. Well, we're kind of uh, getting toward the end of our time, so I'd like to uh, stop here and do the picks. Ben, do you want to start us off with picks? Uh, sure. I just have one. Uh, a while back, I canceled the cable. Uh, in fact, I, I have just the, whatever they call the basic package, where it gives you the local channels, but delivered through your cable box. Uh, and I only have that to get to to get internet because they come as a package deal. So I think that only costs ten dollars a month. 
but they give you standard deaf channels and they look terrible. And uh, my kids like to watch football, as do I occasionally. And so I just picked up an HD antenna. I wish I had done this many years ago. <laughs> These HD antennas, if you can get a good signal, they just have a ridiculously good picture. And they're free. You just got to grab them out of the air. So go pick up an HD antenna if you're if you're one of me, one of those cable cutters like me. So which one did you actually get? I, you know, I was looking for it on Amazon. I went to Best Buy because this is sort of a Thanksgiving thing, and we had a bunch of people coming over, and I wanted to uh, have nice looking football on the television. Uh, it's one of the flat ones, and <laughs> it tends to work best if I just sort of, if I were to like dangle a rope from the ceiling and hang it behind my TV, just you know, ten feet in the air. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't work well if I have it down low, like in a shelf or sort of propped up against a window. So whenever I get a new house, I'll probably be mounting one of these on the roof to really get a good signal. But uh, I would say stay away from the cheap ones because uh, you'll be able to get some channels and not all of the channels. It just depends on where you live and, you know, houses near you and stuff like that. Uh, so, you know, higher is better. But yeah, it was one of the flat high gain antennas. It was about 60 bucks. Okay, I tried doing that a few years ago and just... I could get like one channel consistently and other ones were pretty bad, but I'll try hanging it from the ceiling. See if my wife will <laughs> like that. <laughs> Man, every time I try to talk to my wife about cutting the cable, it's like, think of the children. I, you know, think of it like this, Chuck. Like, let's just assume you pay 60 bucks a month for Oh, cable. you're preaching to the choir here. <laughs> okay. I, I would so, love to cut the cable. So 60 bucks a month is like a seriously low estimate for cable. I think, yes. I think, uh, I was talking to somebody at Thanksgiving they spend over two hundred dollars on internet and cable TV a month, and I was like, "What? How does I don't even that doesn't compute?" So uh, at sixty dollars a month, like the the seasons of shows on Apple TV are cost about thirty bucks. So you could buy you know episodes of like you know Downton Abbey and Dexter and Game of Thrones and just buy all the seasons, and you still won't be amounting to sixty dollars a month. So yeah, we we'd have to do that for the kids shows is what my wife worries about. Uh, my kids are content with Netflix for the most part. Yeah, and sometimes she puts on the Netflix show, so I don't know. Anyway. Yeah, do it. I think it's just convenient <laughs> for her to just, you know, point the tuner at a channel and then just leave it for an hour or so. Yeah. But Netflix will play the next episode automatically, so I guess that's not even an issue. Anyway, interesting conversation. That sounds really cool. Uh, Jane, what are your picks? Okay, there's a lot of talk on how to recession-proof your career. I'm going to tell you guys how to apocalypse-proof your career. Shotgun. So, okay. So after <laughs> the apocalypse, all right, programming is going to be a little bit different than what we're used to. You know, there's going to be no Ruby, so Chuck, you're out of luck. Ben, if you think we're going to be able to fall back on our .NET stuff, it's not going to be around. But what is going to be around? Enterprise Java. But I'm going to cry. So enter- <laughs> Please don't pick Enterprise Java. Please don't pick Enterprise Java. I'm not picking Please don't Enterprise pick Java. Enterprise. <laughs> we have to. We have to survive. We have to survive. So competition for jobs is going to be fierce. So what do we do for job interviews? They always Shotguns. do fizz buzz, right? So everyone just goes and does the fizz buzz, writes it on the wall board. But for Java, I'm going to tell you how you can ace your Java interview. And that's called Fizz Buzz Enterprise Edition. So you can take your FizzBuzz code. You think you can just do it? Add factory factory. I'm sure it does. It's got serious namespaces, all sorts of things. Um, This is a great uh, way to just uh, overanalyze everything. You think you can just add two numbers together or divide them? No, you need a strategy. You need a strategy for that. So I don't know. This is a really funny website. Two things: it can help you kind of learn kind of what design patterns are, and on another case, it's also great to just kind of laugh at uh, often people into design patterns overdo them, and this is taking a simple problem to the most extreme example. So, Enterprise is Buzz. Check it out. Awesome. That's my pick. All right, Pete, what are your picks? I'm so jealous of James pick style. Every time. <laughs> it's just awesome. And I'm also loving just to like chuck randomly in the background saying, shotguns. <laughs> I've been watching The Walking Dead. That's one of my picks. Me too. Anyway. <laughs> I just barely started. Oh man, I I'm really into The Walking Dead. It messes with my head a little bit though. Like I I find myself thinking dark thoughts after watching that show too much. <laughs> I uh sorry, this is a total sidebar, but that James pick is particularly uh struck strikes a chord with me. We we as part of the the kind of the notoriously hard recruiting process for Fortworks, we have a coding 
submission. So people have to write a little uh, solution to a little kind of simple coding problem. And uh, sometimes I do see some amazing Java patterns. Like it's a simple problem and people have got abstract strategy factory patterns and all sorts of nonsense. So I can definitely relate to that stuff. Like that connection manager connections. Yes, manager is always a good thing to stick at the end of, of any class name. Uh, makes it sound more official, I think. Oh, man, I'm, factory going, managers. I'm going through this FizzBuzz thing. This is gold. <laughs> it's so funny. <laughs> Java, com, serious company, business. <laughs> <laughs> package naming package. Right. Sorry, continue. No, uh, oh, man. Okay, so um, my first pick is, I f- I'm pretty sure no one's picked this yet. This um, It's a, a, a mobile web app called forecast.io. So this came to mind when me and Ben were kind of having a little debate there about using web technology. So this is a really good example that proves Ben's point, I think, that um, you have to really know what you're doing to make a, a mobile web app that feels like an actual application, not like a, a web page. Uh, but I think these guys, these guys do a really impressive job. It's at least interesting to to look at and they also have a good blog where they talk about some of the uh some of the the crazy hoops that they jump through in order to make it feel like a native app so forecast.io go there on your cell phone and uh check that out my second pick is extremely random i just randomly said stranger in a strange land earlier and so i'm going to pick the book stranger in a strange land by robert heim something i can't remember his second name i've read this book like three times it's like classic sci-fi it's also, it was written in like the 50s or the 60s. Um, so it's actually pretty misogynistic. He has some pretty old fashioned views about women's place in the world. So, uh, you kind of have to have some virtual earmuffs when you're reading some stuff, but it's a really good book. It's just like good kind of like classic sci fi. Um, I you're going to pick Iron Maiden. <laughs> That reference passes me by. I was, uh, yeah, I, I didn't, I didn't have that that in my childhood for some reason. And my last pick is uh, is a beer because I like picking beer. Uh, I recently went to Cincinnati, Ohio, and uh, while at, in Cincinnati, Ohio, I had a Mad Tree identity crisis. The brewery is called Mad Tree. The beer is called Identity Crisis. It's a black IPA. I'm generally not a fan of black IPAs. I kind of think they're a little bit of a hipster, like, made-up thing. Like, hey, let's make take an IPA and make it black. But this one is actually really good. It tastes kind of, like, quite stouty, but it's still got that kind of, like, big old, like, West Coast hops. So um, it's if, you, if, you, if you're not a fan of black IPAs, but you are a fan of IPAs and you're a fan of stouts, then try this one and maybe it'll uh, expand your mind a little bit. That's it. All right. Well, I've got a couple of picks here. My first pick is, as I said, The Walking Dead. I don't know. I'd heard about it. I just hadn't gotten, you know, gotten around to watching it. And I couldn't sleep a couple of nights ago. And so I watched like two episodes and I was, I was hooked. The funny thing is, is that most of the time, if I turn on a show while I'm trying to go to sleep, it'll eventually kind of wind me down and I can just, you know, lay down and go to sleep. The Walking Dead is not that show. And I have. That's, that's why I don't watch that. That's why I don't watch it. It's always sunny before bed because that is like the most stressful thing to watch. <laughs> what is the Walking Dead? It's no, no. Sorry, it's always sunny. Do you watch that show? Uh huh. Oh, it's a, it's hilarious, but it's a bunch of people screaming at each other for twenty minutes. So it's it's not quite the relaxing net late night TV. Yeah, makes sense. Anyway, so yeah, so I'm I, I'm enjoying it. The only time I really have to watch shows is in the evening when I'm trying to unwind. But I'm anyway, I'm really enjoying it. It's just it, it keeps me awake. So uh yeah, so that's one pick. Another pick, I've been uh reading another book. Um this one was recommended to me by somebody who uh reviewed some of the material for my upcoming um freelancing class uh on how to find clients. And it's Duct Tape Marketing by Jim Janch. And I'm I'm really enjoying it. And it really kind of drove home a couple of things that I felt we're missing from my class, and so I get to fill in those gaps now. And it's also really helped me just sit down and figure out some of the stuff that I can improve on in my own marketing. And, you know, I, I'm pretty good, I think, at finding clients, but there's always room for improvement. And in my case, improvement is usually comes down to quality over quantity. It's usually not hard for me to find work, but, um, you know, finding more of the people that kind of 
are the people that I want to work with. Um, I enjoy working with all kinds of people, but there's a certain type of project with a certain type of entrepreneur that really gets me fired up. And so um, I've been working on that kind of marketing to get those kinds of people coming to my business so that I can work with them. So that's been kind of interesting. And since I'm talking about it, if you are working on an iOS app and you need some kind of back end built, I am supremely qualified for that. I can build it in Ruby on Rails and get you what you need. So anyway, I'll just throw that out there too. And uh, with that, I guess we'll wrap up. Uh, hope you all had a, a very merry holiday season, um, whether that's Christmas or something else. And uh, we'll catch you all in a week.